Bonjour everyone. Hello, Villa France people. <laughs> so happy to be back with you for yet another uh, talk on a, one of the most influential uh, French women of all times, La Veuve Clicquot. You remember, we started this. Uh... Bonjour everyone. Hello, Vive la France people. <laughs> so happy to be back with you for yet another uh, talk on a, one of the most influential uh, French women of all times, La Veuve Clicquot. You remember, we started this uh, journey through uh, the lives of uh, influential women with uh, Joan of Arc, we moved on to Coco Chanel. I also did my Marie Antoinette talk at Sacred Heart. I talked about Agnès Varda during one of the New Orleans uh, French film festivals. So it's been a kind of a, a series, I would say. And I remember having done the last one on La Baroness Pontalba in New Orleans. So I'm happy to be back in the game. And today I'm presenting to you someone who was a business savvy woman who really pioneered into a lot of techniques and strategies that we all use now in the business world. So I hope you'll enjoy this talk. It will be done the way I usually do them with a lot of visuals and my voice in the background for you to follow the journey of this amazing lady. I hope that everyone is safe and has been able to uh, survive this uh, pandemic. Uh, I know for some of you, it's been hard. It's been hard for me here uh, and my mom in a nursing home, but Aaron and I have been able to uh, survive uh, the epic uh, efforts that it required. Uh, so I hope you'll have a good spring and summer and I hope to see you soon when I come back to New Orleans. So when we think about Veuve Clicquot, we ask ourselves the following, what makes her out of the ordinary? Is it the fact that in 1805, she overcame the premature loss of her husband, Francois, who had inherited the business from his own father, Philippe, is it that she had to impose herself at the age of 27 at the head of a champagne wine trading company at a time when, as you know, women were confined to the role of mother and wife? Or is it what it is so obvious on this famous portrait by painter Léon Cognier, Madame Barbe Nicole, known as La Veuve Clicquot, verb meaning widow, a famous woman with a harsh grip. Also, we are awed by her determination and resilient character that was needed to transform the family business founded in 1772 by her father-in-law into one of the most prestigious and important champagne houses in the world. In fact, production, which was around 100,000 bottles a year when she took over in 1805, reached about 750,000 bottles by the time she died in 1866. Vav Clicquot then became one of the jewels of luxury products and the French art de vivre, not only in France, but in New York, London, or St. Petersburg. However, her career as a business leader does not start under the best auspices. At the beginning of the 19th century, the economic situation deteriorated as the Napoleonic Wars closed markets for French products abroad. After her commercial withdrawal from Russia in 1809, the widow tried to return to new bases. Concerned about her independence, she separated from her partners to create her own business, to which she attached her maiden name, Veuve Clicquot Ponsarda, as we will see later on a label. It refocused on the national market, but expanded to include the Belgian, Dutch, and German departments annexed by the First Empire. In 1810, she was known as the one who elaborated the first known vintage champagne in the region. So as you can see here, 
we have a map of the Champagne regions and what region, sorry. And um, this is very important for you to know that this is a very agricultural rich region um, where you can find a lot of farms on those chalk plains. Some of you might have visited um, the area already. And the farms there are large, capital intensive and highly mechanized, even at the time. Um, cereals, especially wheat and barley, are widely cultivated there and other major crops, including alfalfa, sugar beets, vegetables, and oleaginous plants such as rapeseed. Um, you have large quantities of champagne and table wine that are produced annually over there. Of course, the champagne industry, as you can see in, on the map, is of great importance around Reims. Um, Reims is actually not mentioned on that map. Uh, yes, up, you know, in, on north in the Ardennes and uh, around Epernay, uh, where it is a major employer. Uh, Dom Perignon, uh, for example, uh, from 1638 to 1715, who discovered how to make champagne sparkle was born just east of Epernay in Saint Menoud. Uh, and this is the reason why he's also known as the father of uh, champagne. So, what is also important in terms of uh, the forest there is that afforestation was uh, necessitated by centuries of small industrial and domestic overcutting was undertaken during that same 19th century. Um, so what is important is during that period, um, all her efforts were not enough. Um, Barbe, that was her first name, Barbe Nicole, but she all, all often is referred to as Barbe. Barbe was eager to win back the flagship market in Russia, which she had to abandon. In June 1814, when the Emperor Napoleon had just abdicated, she sent a ship loaded with 75 tons to the court of Tsar Alexander I, who would celebrate the victory against Napoleon by drinking her drink, or shall we call it her elixir. Having a preferred competition to diplomatic fair play, the wine Klikovskoe, as I indicated on the slide here, was the translation that Vefrico did of her champagne. This champagne quickly became synonymous with champagne all over Russia, specifically in St. Petersburg and Moscow. It would also be the guest star at the many banquets and balls held during the Vienna Congress. A Businesswoman, the widow Clico reinvested her profits in the acquisition of vines, yielding the best vintages of champagne and other wines in Bouzy, in Verzi, in Verzenay, in Avis, or on the Côte des Blancs, until she held more than 500 hectares, soon to be renamed by her contemporaries La Grande Dame de la Champagne, La Champagne being here the region and not the wine. Uh, she took a parallel interest in the manufacturing processes that she constantly improved. At the beginning of the 19th century, the quality of production remained very uncertain and deserved some witty innovations. Yeasts, for example, promote the formation of gelatinous filaments that disturb the champagne and alter its flavor. To limit this risk, it's necessary to carry out tedious and long manipulations. Thus, the employees in the cellars, who were, as you, some of you probably know, were already equipped with masks or face shields to prevent corks from popping into their face or into their eyes, those employees uh, had to slightly turn each bottle a quarter turn once a day to make these filaments fall into the neck and obtain a lighter wine of a better taste after removal of the, of the capsule and deposit. Well, in 1816, with the help of her cellar master, Antoine Alois de Muller, who was a German guy, 
the widow pioneered into simplifying this operation of turning once a day the bottles. And the duo developed tilted and hole punched stirring tables, uh, as you can see here on the slide. All one had to do was to insert the bottle into those holes and rotate the table to obtain a more reliable result and clarify the wine with much less effort. This method, known as la table de remuage, was adopted by many houses of Champagne from then onward. On this slide, you could see that her innovations went as far as adding a preparation, um, a pioneering, sorry, into a preparation. Uh, often the tradition of Champagne was adding a um, preparation based on elderberries to obtain the Champagne Rosé, but Madame Clicquot went as far as creating the very first Rosé d'assemblage by mixing a little of its red wine of Bouzy with its Champagne. And that gives you that wonderful uh, vintage uh, Champagne Rosé with its beautiful uh, signed pink uh, box. To protect her brand, she also uh, sued all those who tried to counterfeit her, changed the labels each season so they could not be reproduced, and published ads in the press to warn her clientele. Uh, all these measures were in vain, unfortunately, as counterfeit copies could be found all the way to Russia, through which Louis Bonner, in charge of marketing the Clicquot cuvées, tirelessly traveled. In one of the letters he sent to Bob in Reims, this faithful salesman informed her that local counterfeiters were usurping her name. What those offered was, I quote, an infamous mixture of wines from Grave, Sauterne, birch water, and liquor, end of quote, which was selling, I quote, like hot bread, end of quote, he informed her with indignation. So she was literally the victim of her own success. And that kind of ruthless attitude towards counterfeits gave her that uh, reputation of being harsh and uh, ruthless in business. Such illegal proceedings do not matter after all. In a way, counterfeiting is the price of glory as we've seen in many other instances for luxury brands. And Veuve Clicquot made her own reputation grow by adapting to the taste of each nation. For Russians, for example, it's interesting to know the Champagne House sells a very sweet and sparkling wine that joyfully refreshes the guests. For the English customers, it's necessary to propose a wine that is not too sweet or tart. Another talent of Bob was to have a knack to know how to choose with discernment the collaborators. After the accidental death of her international hit salesman, Louis Bonne, that I was just mentioning, she recruited Edouard Verle, this other German who was equally devoted to her, saved her from a poorly controlled diversification. At one point, she tried to mix too much and to mix too much, and um, he warned her uh, against those dangers and put her back on the right path. Thanks to the support she received, the widow Clicquot managed to repay all her creditors over the years and proposed to Verle to become her partner at the age of 30 when she was herself 54. The succession of the business was therefore assured, and Barb retired to the sumptuous castle of Bourseau. Isn't it beautiful with this beautiful mirroring pond and all the vineyards in the back that you cannot see here? Um, uh, and this castle actually uh, had been built for um, daughter Clementine, who inherited it. And this is where uh, Vertrico died at the age of. 89. I'll share, you, I will share with you this uh, wonderful quote, wine is me, which is, of course, something that uh, the widow Clicquot would repeat all the time, paraphrasing uh, Louis XIV. Um, and uh, the stature of this woman uh, explains why even nowadays she, is, um, she has given her name uh, to uh, one of the biggest and most important business women 
Award in France, le prix de la femme d'affaires, uh, which has been in place uh, for the last uh, 46 years, and uh, that actually awards women of exception for their entrepreneurial uh, spirit. So this is held every year. Uh, this past year, of course, it was done um, digitally uh, by internet, but the, the selection still happened. So this is how powerful and uh, revered uh, she was in the field of business. Uh, let me show you for the next few slides um, a little bit of uh, a range of posters that were printed in her time or beyond. And you know how much I like semiotic analysis, but they all capture something about either her time or a way to sell. Uh, this one, obviously, it's La Belle Époque, turn of the 19th century, beginning of a 20th century, with the curved lines. Uh, the, fest the festive character of Champagne is always referred to uh, in those early ads. And uh, what is interesting here is the popping of the cork um, and uh, the slogan, Veuve Clicquot, uh, which if you actually don't pay too much attention can read as Vive Clicquot, uh, which is a, a beautiful pun. Um, you also uh, can see on uh, the uh, label, the mentioning of uh, the place where the champagne comes from, which is uh, what uh, French law requires when it comes to a vintage wine. You need not so much to talk about the type of wine that it is, but the region, the vintage uh, from which it originates. On this one, we can see that it was highly popular, of course, in the 60s in the United States. It's French, it's imported, it's Clicquot Champagne. So once again, the uh, referring to the exotic nature. It is French, therefore it is uh, classy and it's something that is highly coveted. So there is uh, a feeling of uh, exceptionality, of elitist um, marketing, which has never left the brand. Um, in the next slide, you could see the lines have been stylized. This was in the early 90s, uh, beginning of 2000s as well. Um, this reminds me of Gruel um, uh, ad ads for perfumes of Dior. Uh, this was in the mid 2000s, uh, this idea that once again, uh, merging the United States and France. So here we're referring to Los Angeles, California, uh, in the same vein that uh, Air France posters were made, uh, very stylized, but still very classy. Uh, a lifestyle basically is being sold here, not so much uh, a drink or an alcohol. Uh, here we're going back to, um, on the left side of the 1910s and 20s, uh, with reference the mentioning of the city, Reims, France. Pont Sarda is also mentioned. Uh, as I explained to you, she used her maiden name. But on the right side, what is interesting is this new development of products, byproducts, and um, um, the expansion of uh, the name. This is due to the fact that uh, just like Champagne Mercier, uh, Veuve Clicquot is owned by uh, the conglomerate uh, Louis Vuitton now, LVMH, and they tend to um, try to expand uh, alcohol uh, products into leather goods, um, perfumes, fragrances, interior um, fragrances, and all types of things. And here we see shoes um, that are reminiscent of uh, old baseball shoes or golfing shoes or old aviators shoes. So um, this is once again selling a lifestyle and the orange color or that dark yellow is always uh, the trademark of uh, La Veuve Clique. Finally, going fast uh, on these beautiful ads, uh, very modern, once again, referencing the color orange to match with every new products. Uh, same thing here with this beautiful, very stylized, almost Japanese. It almost looks like an etching from uh, by Matisse or uh, 
uh, or even much more uh, modern and contemporary um, design. But here, the mentioning of bold, the boldness of Africa is what um, uh, captures, uh, captivates us. Uh, there is not even a mentioning of any alcohol, any bottle. Uh, the Vertlico name suffices uh, to drag us into uh, purchasing and at least being interested in the brand. Uh, finally, uh, I, will, I wanted to share with you those beautiful ways to uh, uh, showcase uh, the wine. I will go back to how to serve a Veuve Clicquot Champagne uh, in the last part of uh, this presentation, but I couldn't uh, help but show in, showing it to you how beautifully um, crafted some of those ideas are and how original those can be. Um, the question is, um, how do we recognize actually an authentic bottle of Clicquot Champagne? Well, um, until nine, 1798, the bottles had no distinguished marks and Philippe Clicquot, founder of the house, chose to mark his corks with an anchor. And as you can see, this has been um, uh, developed and redeveloped uh, in the more contemporary designs. Uh, anchor, uh, as you know, being a symbol of hope and prosperity, not only for sale men, but uh, as a symbol as a whole. Um, the year 1811 was actually an exceptional vintage in Champenois, but more particularly a year marked by the passage of the comet Flaugerg, uh, designated Comet Imperial by Napoleon. So from the anchor, uh, we switch to another symbol that I'm gonna show you in a second, but here I wanted to show you a modern version of that anchor, which is still uh, part of the um, heritage uh, of the brand. So after the passage of the Comet in 1814, Madame Clicquot took advantage of the opening uh, of the Russian markets to ship many bottles from the year of the comet. And all those um, cork uh, had this label glued to them uh, with a little comet that appeared. So the success being immense, Madame Clicquot will decide to play to the point of making this comet appear on every cork onward. In 1877, the House of Champagne innovated again by experimenting with the orange yellow label, this original and distinctive sign would become one of the main recognition marks of the bottles of the brand Veuve Clicquot P. Werle ou Verle, the name of her associate. There's something um, really surprising is uh, about this, the bottle that was found in this um, case. It was a 200 year old bottle of the Clicquot Champagne that was sold for 30,000 euros during a sale in the Oland, uh, Oland excuse me, archipelago in, in 2011, I believe, yes, it was 2011. It was part of a cargo found in July 2010 in the wreckage of a schooner that sank between approximately um, approximately 1825 and 1830, not far from the Finnish autonomous archipelago. The divers raised a total of 168 bottles. It's truly a moving bottle because it's Madame Clicquot's wine in person, so to speak. Uh, and this is Fabienne Moreau reminding us of how uh, wonderful Madame Clicquot's heritage is. Um, I couldn't talk about Champagne and Clicquot without mentioning that I used not, I didn't know much about Champagne until I met a friend who was from the Champagne region, uh, who um, worked at UMass Lowell, where I also teach uh, courses online. Her name is Carol. And Carol once told me about the selection that um, she and her family were doing whenever they had something to celebrate. Uh, so being from Champagne, of course, there's a wide selection. Uh, and she really put forward some of the names that are on this list. So I can, uh, I really want to share that with you. 
Um, these are the seven most searched champagne brands in the world, according to Wine Folly. And it uh, more or less corresponds to um, what Carol told me, except one exception um, that I will um, develop after this. I will not talk about Veuve Clicquot because um, Karen has probably said a few words about uh, the Veuve Clicquot specificity uh, and idiosyncrasies, but um, I will focus on Dom Pérignon. Dom Pérignon, Truly is a prestige cuvee owned by Mouet and Chandon, and it, which is also part of the luxury conglomerate that owns Louis Vuitton. And Dom Pérignon ages at least seven years before it is released, and that ensures maximum deliciousness. So please make sure um, that you uh, try, if you haven't tried yet, a Dom Pérignon. Uh, the Ace of Spades uh, champagne, uh, well, it's easy to disregard Jay-Z's hyped champagne brand, uh, but Armand de Brignac is quite well made. Uh, for those of you who like creamy bubble finesse and uh, almond orange notes, this is the champagne for you. And it helps a lot that the bottle looks like some kind of beautiful art deco um, glitter and sparkling uh, gold lame uh, bottle. The Boulanger is produced with a blend made primarily of Pinot Noir, but as a white wine. And white cherry and smoke flavors are more common in wines made with red grapes. So this is the one you need to go if you like those type of flavors. Um, one that I was actually introduced to by my students when we were finished with the semester, they, would, they once brought me a crystal bottle. Crystal has a, a golden hue and honey nuances that carry on in a lingering finish, according to Wine Folly. And crystal is a prestige vintage champagne by family-owned Louis Roderer. As I'm sure you know and you're familiar with this. Uh, Perrier Jouet is probably in terms of taste, my favorite. It's offered at a value price for most champagne at around, in France, it's about um, 23 euros and in America, it's $40 a bottle. Perrier Jouet uh, tastes a pear, that's why I like it, and a touch of creaminess. Uh, it's usually slightly sweeter than Veuve Clicquot. Finally, Krug. Uh, the process of making both Krug and Salon is a serious time investment. Aging champagne imparts more tertiary, tertiary aromas of croissant and frangipan, can you imagine? So you're both in uh, Champagne, in Alsace, and uh, it's a kind of flavor of France, a typical flavor of France that comes to you when you, um, when you drink Krug. So, this is something to try on uh, the 14th of July, I suggest. Um, but as I was telling you, this list actually uh, was lacking, was missing one. And my, I would say, ersatz, my, the best ersatz I could find to Vaughn Clicquot is definitely uh, the champagne by Nicolas Feuillat. Uh, Nicolas Feuillat. Um, is also my friend uh, Carol's recommendation. Um, it, a lot, lot has been written about the Champagne of Nicolas Foyat, but um, here is a, a quite a fresh look at two of the operations most available bottlings, bottlings from the Reserve Exclusive uh, Special Vintage Series. Uh, well, it's actually a non-vintage Brut and a Rosé, um, but um, they are available in standard bottles and in uh, 187 millimeter, millimeter splits that can be consumed with, uh, uh, well, basically nothing more than a straw. So I really like this uh, uh, Reserve Exclusive Brut Champagne. There's a lot of toasty brioche up top and there's a lively fruit component that comes into focus when you actually taste it once again. A uh, taste of apples, of pears, plus a tropical spin to it that gives it uh, a little bit more of a crispiness and life. 
but as opposed to the um, Fayat Reserve Exclusive Rosé Champagne, which is less overwhelmingly fruity than you might expect. Uh, but at the same time, it's not particularly sweet, uh, though it has a cherry and strawberry character in the back. And uh, it worked well with a creamy, a creamy character up top. Um, usually, you know, uh, a rosé is always just like for wines, right? It's less serious than the brut, but it's certainly summery and festive. So, I, I, you know, just like a rosé wine is to um, uh, a red or a red wine, well, same kind of parallel. This is what a rosé champagne is to a regular brut uh, champagne. Um, I also want to share with you uh, my favorite cellar visit uh, when I was in the Champagne region. I visited with um, my friend Carole. Uh, she took us to um, Champagne Mercier. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Champagne Mercier. It's not um, in itself, uh, it's always, um, I would say, forgotten when making lists of champagnes that are really uh, wonderful. So it's an average quality champagne. But what is great about Champagne Mercier is its cellar. As you can see here on this uh, triptych, you have a beautiful uh, barrel uh, when you enter the lobby. And as you're waiting for the little train to take you down to, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of kilometers of um, cellars, uh, you can enjoy uh, tasting the different champagnes that they sell, and you uh, get ready to get into that beautiful underworld, uh, which is absolutely fanta a fantastic experience. And it is by far the best cellar visit you can get in the region. So much so that my friend Carol uh, decided to take us to Epernay. It's, it's uh, located in Epernay, the birth of uh, Champagne, and said and explained that even though it was not a great Champagne, uh, the visit of the cellar was worth it. Uh, something about the Champagne as well. Uh, you probably have heard of this beautiful and fun uh, British series, absolutely fabulous, that ran uh, five seasons from 1992 to 2012. It used to be referred to, it was referred to as Ab Fab, uh, starring Jennifer Saunders and Joanne Lumley. Uh, both are extremely heavy drinking uh, characters, they're drug abusing. Uh, one is uh, on the left, uh, um, uh, the character is a PR agent. And as you can see, they have always handy in their kitchen, uh, literally a wall of, of, of Clicquot and they're hilarious. I strongly recommend their humor. It's sassy, it's uh, witty, it's British, and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Um, so this was my little wink at uh, another way to look at um, the champagne. Finally, I wanna take you on a little uh, do's and don'ts on how to serve champagne, which I've learned over the years and compiling all the information about some sites that you could find uh, and some recommendations from Elle Magazine. Uh, I will start with uh, one recommendation, which is do chill the champagne but don't ice it. So before serving champagne, it does, in, it does indeed need to be chilled, right? But the optimum serving temperature, according to the experts for champagne is between eight degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. Don't ask me to turn this into Fahrenheit. Lived in the state 20 years, still can do it. You can achieve this by either chilling it in the fridge for three hours before serving, uh, friends and family, or in a champagne bucket in a mixture of ice and water for 30 minutes. Never chill champagne in the freezer. That's a no-no because it will kill the bubbles and in general over chilling will mean that the wine is too cold to release its aromas and flavors. Uh, quel dommage, right? The second recommendation is do be careful when opening champagne. You know that um, the workers um, were actually wearing shields and helmets in order not to be uh, knocked down by, uh, knocked out by some um, uh, recalcitrant uh, corks, uh, but it's true. Uh, you have to be careful. There's around five to six atmospheric pressure 
within a bottle of champagne, which has the capability to pop a cork out at 50 miles per hour. When opening a bottle, remove the foil and then release the metal cage. Hold the bottle away from you at an angle about uh, only 45 degree angle and place the cork in the palm of your hand whilst holding the base. Twist the bottle slowly. And if the cork refuses to budge, run warm water on the neck of the bottle for a few seconds. Never make it pop. This is the third recommendation. Of course, unless you are a rock star or some kind of Formula One driver, it's better etiquette to open a bottle of champagne with a hiss rather than a loud pop. Yes, indeed. In refined dining circumstances, and if we follow etiquettes uh, from around the world, actually, um, guests should not be disturbed by the popping sound of a champagne bottle. And often, you know how in public gatherings we make that moment the big, the big, you know, the big moment of the party, and everyone wants to hear that. We're actually not in uh, refined circles. So to avoid the pop, you have to open the bottle very slowly and with a great deal of control. They said many people live for the pop, so these are only <laughs> recommendations. Please do as you wish. Uh, I certainly don't want to take uh, away from you the sense of festivity. Finally, don't serve champagne in a mug, of course. According to the Comité Interprofessionnel du Vin de Champagne, the ideal glass to serve champagne is a tulip-shaped glass, as this will best keep the bubbles in. Um, due to the width of the champagne coupe, said to be modeled on our friend Marie Antoinette's left breast, I don't know if you knew that, uh, the bubbles and aromas of the drink are quickly lost into the air. Always rinse your champagne glasses with hot water before you use and leave to drain. Do not dry them with a cloth or a tea towel as some of the fibers can stick to the glass and dull the effervescent stream of bubbles. Once the champagne is poured, my friend Carol says, uh, and I also find that in grapeescapes.net uh, site, um, the color of the drink should be admired and the bubbles should be dancing uh, you can inhale the aroma of the drink. You can finally taste the wine. Uh, and this is by keeping your mouth uh, uh, for a few seconds to enjoy keeping your mouth, in, keeping it in your mouth. No, don't swallow it immediately for a few seconds to enjoy the true nature of the champagne. Uh, whether it is light or full bodied, uh, simple or complex. And most importantly, enjoy. Well, I hope you did enjoy this small presentation uh, that I really wanted to do for all of you. Uh, once again, I had fun preparing uh, about this wonderful lady. And uh, I really truly hope that I will be able to see all of you soon uh, uh, and that we all be able to celebrate uh, the going back to a normal life probably with a Veuve Clicquot coupe de champagne. Merci beaucoup. Et à bientôt à tous et à toutes. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, Jean did an excellent job, I think, uh, explaining Veuve Clicquot and different champagne um, do's and don'ts at the end. Um, if you see my background, that is actually from Absolutely Fabulous. Coincidentally, whenever he sent the presentation over, I've been using this background for the past year on Zoom. And I was like, oh, perfect. He sent, the, he sent Patsy and Eddie's uh, refrigerator over. Um, so I was like, I need to put this. Um, so anyway, thanks to Jean for that wonderful presentation. And it looks like you guys are having a lot of fun too. I see some of you drinking champagne and other things. And some of you look like you have a really good spread of food. So I'm, I'm jealous of that right now. Um, next up on our presentation, we're gonna have uh, Veronique Day and she's gonna lead the champagne tasting of the Veuve Clicquot, which we just heard so much about. 
And let me just give you a short bio on Veronique. Um, she's a native of Paris, France, and has been living in New Orleans for 18 years. She's been a longtime member of L'Union Francaise and has been a presenter at our Vive la France series many times. She and her husband, Michael, own a tour company, Dubloon Tours, that usually organizes a yearly trip to France in conjunction with this Vive la France series. Um, and she is currently working teaching French literature at Lycée Francais. So I'd like to introduce Véronique and um, let her speak now. And um, be there, Ver Véronique? There you okay. go. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And then thanks again uh, to uh, Jean's presentation, which as always uh, was uh, very fine and uh, interesting. So we, we all enjoyed it here. And, um, and all our attention was uh, towards the screen. So I'm just gonna read a few words that actually he wrote. This is not my poem, this is uh, Jean's poem. Uh, just to give us an idea of uh, some of the description of the wine and some of the making of the wine and just a few a few things and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my own experience about uh, champagne. Uh, before I do so, I just want to say a word about uh, um, the balloon tour. The balloon tour which was uh, supposed to go to champagne uh, the very infamous year of 2020 uh, when we all uh, ended up being stuck at home uh, uh, drinking uh, bubbly water or something just, you know, insipid. Uh, but anyway, not champagne, but we were supposed to go there. We were supposed to have a, 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 a trip that would couple two regions of France. Uh, the first one was Burgundy, where we would have tasted all of the wonderful wine from Burgundy. And, uh, and since Champagne is just uh, a mile away, <laughs> figuratively speaking, uh, from Burgundy, we would we would um, the, pro the the idea was to end up in Champagne and, and visit, of course, um, the wonderful cellar of Mercier and and some of the places and taste Champagne. So uh, perhaps uh, next year, uh, if the world uh, allows us to do so, uh, if the travel companies allows us to fly and uh, and and so on, uh, we'll be able to uh, to propose this trip again. So uh, look. Uh, look uh, for our uh, advertisement through L'Union Francaise and we'll let, we'll let us know, we'll let everybody know whether this is going to happen or not. Uh, hopefully it will, hopefully it will. Um, anyway, so uh, product description, we're talking about the champagne. The yellow label is a signature of the Veuve Clicquot's quality and style, recreated every year thanks to our Prasnes collection of reserve wines it's a brilliant label, yellow label, which is the one that we're going to be drinking tonight. Reflect the champagne's bright personality and impeccable wine-making wine credentials. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I'm going to like show the bottles. I'm sure some of you have already uh, opened this, but we, we kind of saved it because this is the only one we have here. <laughs> so <laughs> we saved it for Quinoa. <laughs> Grapes from as many as 50 to 60% uh, different vintage wine go to the blending of the yellow label. Uh, the winemaker blends 30 to 45 percent of reserve wine with grapes from as many as 50 to 60 different cru, cru we say in French. The Pinot Noir predominant, 50 to 55 percent, provides the structure that is so typically Veuve Clicquot, while Chardonnay, 28 to 33 percent, adds the elegance and finesse essential to a perfectly balanced wine. And a touch of Meunier, 15 to 20 percent, rounds up the blend. So three blends into this wonderful champagne. That's what you taste with three blends of grapes. The long aging of Crayer, which is the place where those wine are being aged underground. Uh, we'll learn about that uh, in the next presentation. Uh, that we have. Um, uh, three years minimum for the yellow label gives silkiness to the champagne. Mm -hmm. Yep, yum, yum. Tasty notes, uh, Veuve Clicquot yellow label manages to reconcile two opposing factors, strength and silkiness, and to hold them in perfect balance with aromatic intensity and a lot of freshness. 
This consistent power to please makes, uh, makes it ideal for an aperitif and a, as well as a perfect champagne to enjoy with a meal. So you can drink it pretty much anytime you want. Um, breakfast is great as well, <laughs> uh, should you decide so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one spectator's <laughs> says an elegant champagne with a refined, lightly creamy mousse, subtle toast and mineral notes, underscore flavors of gala apple, kumquat, ground ginger, and white pepper with a mouthful finish. Yum, yum. Uh, Venus, I'm not sure how you read that. V-I-N-O-U-S. Venus? Venus? Vino? I don't know. Anyway, one of those magazine, uh, pale bright color, red berries, minerals, and earth, lively penetrating flavors of spiced apple and pear, excellent acidity, youthful wine delivers impressive flavor impact, finishes fresh, firm, long with strong peach and pear notes. There we go. So this is this wonderful wine. And hopefully you'll be able to taste all of that, anything including the gala apple, the kumquat, the ground ginger, the pear, the apple, and all of that. Um, personally, I just taste the bubbles. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, just uh, say one, one quote, give one quote from one of the uh, three important verbs three important widowed uh, that uh, held uh, champagne production in the champagne region. Uh, let me tell you, it is difficult to be a man in a champagne and stay alive uh, because you know your wife is going to push you down the, the street to take over the business <laughs> because uh, there's quite a bit of love that are uh, owning businesses. Some of the most important, of course, La Veuve Clicquot, but also Veuve Pommery, which you may know, and also Veuve Boulanger, which is the closest to us, who lived through the Second World War. And she was quite a lady, uh, apparently. She was one of the women who traveled with a bicycle through the vineyards and always had something to say. She was quite a personality as well. And she said something very interesting about uh, uh, her wine when uh, one of the journalists one time asked her what she thought about her wine and if she drank her wine. And she said, I drink it sometime, whenever I'm alone. When I'm not alone, drinking is a must. In any other circumstances, I don't touch it unless I'm thirsty. <laughs> so this is a Veuve Boulanger here. They give you the wittiness of that person who sort of um, uh, drank wine, uh, drank whole wine and appreciated whole wine. Indeed, you can drink champagne in any circumstances. The French people love the champagne. Uh, they drink it most occasion, actually today is my 20th anniversary, wedding anniversary with my dear husband. And uh, we are going to be opening this wonderful bottle and, uh, and any circumstances, uh, baptism, wedding, um, bar mitzvahs, <laughs> of course, uh, as well as uh, Christmas, uh, the 14th of July. Uh, I mean, certainly anytime there's an important circumstance since family reunion, champagne is always what ends the, uh, what ends the meal. Uh, sometimes it is drunk to begin a meal as an aperitif, and sometimes we like to drink it as a kir royal, actually adding a little bit of cassis. Uh, and, uh, but most of the time it is drunk right before or with the dessert. Uh, because it's a wine that accompanies very well a lot of the sweet sweetness. That's why it's also drank where you drink, we eat foie gras, because it's a very good combination with a foie gras. Mm. So it is something that you drink quite a bit. Um, I was lucky to um, have uh, members of my family on the side of my father who own vineyards uh, very close to the Veuve Clicquot. Uh, and one year I actually went to the, uh, to the vineyards to do the vendange, to do the, you know, picking the grapes. Uh, let me tell you, it is not an easy job. You are waking up with the sunshine because grapes cannot be cut uh, while the sun is too high. So basically your day of work has to be done between four o'clock in the morning and noon. Uh, and during that time, you are picking the grapes. It's cold in the vineyards because it is, I mean, now who knows what it's cold, uh, but it used to be fairly cold in the vineyards. There's dew everywhere. It's absolutely beautiful. 
uh, the daylight is just peaking and you arrive in the vine vineyards and you begin picking the grapes, uh, throw them in those beautiful baskets, and then you get a little breakfast in a vineyard. At some point you stop just to you know, re refuel a little bit. And guess what you have usually? You have a, a grape pie, uh, a pie made with grapes, and you have a little taste of champagne. Why not? And then you finish your day around noon and you go back to the, the house and, uh, and share, of course, um, a meal with the people and have more champagne to drink. So uh, quite wonderful uh, experience uh, to share with people. If you ever have the chance to do the vendange, uh, don't hesitate and uh, do it. So uh, let's open this bottle. Uh, dear husband of mine, would you please? I'm gonna let him do it because I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna pop uh, this thing otherwise. But uh, anyways, Honey Bunny. You really want me to do it? Yes, Come Honey on. Bunny, it's you here. You are on stage uh, in front of everybody. So don't, uh, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no popping, please. Rule number rule number three on. Um, oh, you mean I can't pour it in this mug either? No, no, no. You cannot <laughs> pour it on. We have the perfect wine. It's not exactly the left breast of uh, Marie Antoinette. I don't think it would squeeze in there, but uh, we're going to uh, <laughs> we're going to do our best. So turn the bottle very gently. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Very light. I should mute it so if it pops, you won't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, here we go. Calm the pressure. Here we go. Here it comes. There we go. This nice. is perfect. Here we go. So, this is how it's done. <laughs> this is how it's done. And pour it. It's nice to start pouring with the, uh, the glass slightly angled. And then finish up by putting the glass up so that the bubble, you fill it with bubbles. Yes, there you go. And then, of course, you can see, as Jean was talking about, bubbles and dancing in the glass. And uh, it's a beautiful sight. And we can admire the color of this wine uh, before we taste it. So hopefully, every one of you has opened their bottle. If you haven't done so yet, please do open your bottle. And let's enjoy together this wonderful uh, champagne. Uh, from La Veuve Clicquot. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. <laughs> santé. Santé, santé, yes. <laughs> santé. And of course, you can also take a little bit and put it a little <laughs> bit behind your ears. <laughs> mm, delicious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't care what Jean says. I love champagne and coupe. So I see some other coupe drinkers out there too. I'm not the only one. But all the bubbles are leaving. All the bubbles are going away. So you, you, want, you, want, you have to drink faster. <laughs> Drinking faster is not a problem. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, you've got a whole stash behind you. <laughs> I can just open a bottle here anytime. So, you know. Next week, everybody just come on over and we're going to see if there's really bottles of champagne behind me. We can just open them all and go through them. Absolutely. All right. Good. Well, cheers, I can. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Everybody. Cheers, honey. Mm -hmm. Happy anniversary. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you, thank, you, thank you all for 20. celebrating our anniversary with us. Yes. <laughs> yes we didn't wow, know it was go amazing. we were going to have such a crowd. <laughs> Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to either do the virtual raise hand, or if anybody wants to just say something, you don't necessarily have to have a question, um, feel free. Um, we'd love to get you guys to interact a little bit and make this instead of just so such a passive thing, you know, that Zoom can sometimes be. Uh, we do have a couple of fun polls that we're going to launch, so maybe that'll start the um, the discussion. So I'm curious. What is your favorite champagne label? So I'm going to put this on the screen. And um, if there's multiple of you guys there, you can click more than one choice on this. So I'm curious to see what everybody's going to vote for. Um, and it looks like Karen Walk has raised her hand. And, and you know, before I unmute Karen, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Karen for organizing this. Karen, as most of you guys know, organizes these Vive la France 
series uh, every year. And unfortunately, due to COVID, you know, it's been a little while since we, we've had one. And so she was able to put this together so that we could do it virtually. And hopefully we'll have these back in person in the fall with you guys again. So um, <clears throat> I'm unmuting Karen now, but it doesn't look like Karen's there. It's someone else. Okay, so yes, this is Karen. And um, we want to everyone to toast the luckiest man in New Orleans and in France for the last 20 years. Honey Bunny has been very lucky to be married to Veronique. So toast to toast to Michael. Yes, toast to Michael. Drink up, Honey Bunny. Is that what they call? And then, um, so I'm going to share these results to see. And so this is what everybody's voted. So, not surprisingly, Vov Clico is one of the top voter vote getters for um, favorite champagne brand, favorite champagne label. Um, Veronique, what's yours? Mine is not Vov Clico. I really like uh, uh, Piper Heidsick is my oh, favorite. Also, uh, I love Perrier oh, Jouet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, li I like Mums. I like Mums because it's more about um, experience and memory. Um, I was, um, when, uh, when I, um, I bought my apartment in Paris many, many years ago, uh, it was actually the present that um, my sister had given me. And so we, we got into this apartment, which was completely empty. Everything needed to be redone. It was, it was, it was basically a, a, a junkyard. And my husband and I just sat on the ground on the floor and we just opened that bottle of mom's and drank, drank the champagne because we had to toast this wonderful present that we were, you know, uh, making, you know, doing to ourselves. So, um, so that's the memory of that. And uh, the time that I, we, we, got, we got that, that place, that was ours. Hey. <laughs> And That's I mean, it. let's be honest, there, there's really no bad champagne. So I mean, no matter what you're buying, it's gonna be good. If it's from the Champagne region of France, it's gonna be excellent and delicious. So it just depends what you like, right? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So we have one more poll that we're gonna launch. And so let's see what you guys think about this. So do you prefer a drier or a sweeter champagne? So this should show up on your screen. And again, you can click more than one choice if there are more than one of you yeah. in the room. I, I prefer blue. Yeah, me too, Veronique. I prefer the driest, the, the better for me. The brut or brut, not necessarily extra brut, but brut is definitely some, the best where I think people are voting for the brut also, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that looks like that's gonna be the winner. Um, the sweets are, are okay, but they definitely have to be more dessert. You know, that would yeah, be- Yeah, you have to serve them in the right thing. Yeah. You have to plan ahead. But brut goes along with everything, I think. You know, beginning aperitif or, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can see what everybody voted for. Yes, everybody likes the drier champagne. So it looks like this group does not like the sweet side of champagne. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious, I see a lot of people eating different things. I see there's a, a, a group that's eating quite a, have a big spread there. Um, and then I see some other folks nibbling on things. Anybody want to share what you're nibbling on? I'm curious if you went with some of the choices that we suggested or if you found something else and what do you think goes really well with the, the Vov Clico tonight? Oh God, Veronique's got a good spread. We got the spread here. We've got some, we've got some uh, deviled eggs. We've got some uh, salmon toast with uh, cream cheese and cucumbers. We've got some stuffed um, um, endives with um, a goat cheese. cheese. Yeah. Goat cheese. Sure. Goat cheese. And we've got a spread of cheese. Voila. We'll see what we do next time. It is delicious. Come over, please. <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> what are the other people are eating? Let's find out. Anybody want to share? Okay, somebody said, uh, I don't know this cheese. 
Langris Shalandi cheese. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. <laughs> okay, it looks like Ruth has her hand up. Ruth, go ahead. I'm a, I, it's gonna ask you to unmute so you can unmute yourself. Okay, okay I did. Uh, yes, um, we have a group here. We have uh, Beth, uh, Terry, and um, Elizabeth Wilson and Joan Coulter and Pamela McCall. Uh, we all got together and uh, I'm the hostess um, and I bought the Compt, C-O-M-T-E, that cheese and Sophia and uh, a brie at the St. James um, place. Oh, and I also bought pate. And uh, then I also bought a few things from Rouse's to supplement. And we have fruit and radishes. Radishes that look like the ones that we ate in France in Rouen at that uh, hotel where we stayed. And um, what else? Oh, we have uh, sweets, we have gem cakes, and um, madeleines. Mm, very nice. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That all sounds delicious. Did you, okay. did you hear me? Yep. We heard you. Yeah, that all sounds delicious, Ruth. That's okay, a great it was. A great group of stuff. What's, what's the favorite thing? What is everybody liking the best out of all of those with the champagne? Uh, we had the champagne we had was uh, Verve, Verve Chico, Chica, yeah, Chico. Oh, I'm, I'm still learning how to pronounce it. You say it. That's okay. Verve Clico. Verve Clico, right. That's what we had. And um, the cheese that we liked the best, I think, the brie, I think everybody liked the creamy brie. And the one we liked, the one that I liked the least was the comp. Yeah, Bree's yeah. definitely a crowd pleaser, right? Um, Karen, looks like Karen has something she wants to say about what she's eating. I'm curious, Karen, what are you eating? It's the real Karen this time. Um, well, we're having um, endive leaves with Roquefort um, spread carefully piped in them by one of those little pipers so that it looks like leaves, but some of them got messed up, but but they're all fine. And so we're enjoying that. And we all want to go to that person's house that has all that food. Okay, we're ready to go right now. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Joe, so much. And this is, and thanks, Veronique. This has been wonderful. Okay. Uh, looks, I know Renee has a big spread. Does Renee want to talk about her spread? So Renee, it's, how about you talk about your spread? What are you guys eating over there? I know you're always eating well, so unmute yourself. Wait, give me one second. We have- um, We can hear you. But we have double computer things happening here right now. Hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we did kind of have a really big thing. We ate a lot of it. something back that just came out of the oven. We kind of did a little bit of a guide. I don't really know. We had like eight different cheeses, fruit, custard, cakes. Um, we did some tarts, custard tarts. Um, we had French bread from Don Fong. Um, an assortment of different crackers and fruit. And we may have already had two of our bottles of champagne before we learned how to open them properly. <laughs> but um, oh, we really have, enjoyed ourselves. We have salami for sure. Oh, and then we have some extra, extra dark chocolate. We have Valrona chocolate from France. Mm -hmm. So, um, Joey, as you can tell, we went to Trader Joe's. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm Basically jealous. Basically, just bought everything from the party aisle. I'm so jealous of this spread. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then we can't, of course, forget we did throw a little spinach and artichoke dip in there because why not? 
Yeah. That all sounds it's delicious. Delightful. Thank you. Thank y'all. That all sounds delicious. Um, Judith put in the chat that they're having a quiche with mushrooms and broccoli and a, and a salad with tomatoes and hearts of palm. That sounds perfect too. Um, very French that. Love it. Love, love, love it. Um, thank, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I hope, hope you've enjoyed your champagne and learning about Veuve Clicquot. So uh, we're gonna be doing this again for the next two weeks. So we'll see you here, 6 p.m. Central, um, the next two Tuesdays. So I wanna thank Karen again for organizing the series. I wanna thank our presenters tonight, Jean-Xavier Brage and Veronique Day for their expertise. Also like to thank the wine cellar for making all of this delicious champagne available for us to purchase. And so just remember to please visit them before the next session to purchase your champagne. So I'll see you guys next Tuesday. And the next session will be uh, focused on the champagne region during World War II. So that should be interesting. And I think there's some interesting stories about that. So, um, bon soirée à tous et à la prochaine. Thank you all, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.